Thanks, Neela, and thanks to your Kaufman, another great presentation, I think, very, very interesting, and it all fits quite nicely together, I think. Speaking about implementation and practice, uh, Neela, that I think those were your words, I'm delighted to uh, introduce the second, the, excuse me, the third speaker to you, namely Jörg Erdmann. Welcome also to you. Um, Jörg Erdmann studied at the University of Hamburg, so he's a truly, I'm not going to say hamburger, but I did. Um, and since 1992, he, um, he has been working at Hapa Lloyd in very different positions, including being the managing director for the Bay Area area, a senior, senior vice president integration in Dubai. And since 2017, um, he is the senior director sustainability management of Hapa Lloyd. So we are going to hear a presentation from the shipping sector right now. Um, welcome once again. We are very much looking forward to your presentation. Yes, um, the audience, uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, the chance to talk on the chip owner's perspective. I'm uh, not an article marine or engineer, but as a uh, corporate uh, head of sustainability, rather responsible for the big picture, reporting directly to the uh, CIO, uh, CEO. Um, let me see if I can share the presentation now. It works. <clears throat> My aim in the coming 20 minutes is to give you a view of a container line carrier who operates close to 400 meter long ultra large vessels with a capacity of around 20,000 TUs. We have very specific needs and requirements. My first message is that the maritime industry with its more than 50,000 deep sea vessels is quite diversified in type, size, and propulsion. Let's look at Hapag Lloyd first. As a company with a history of over 170 years, we are used to adopt, transform, and deal with disruptive environments for de decades. Coming from wind and steam to turbine, over nuclear to scrubber and already to LNG. We are the fifth largest global liner shipping company with over 13,000 experts from around 100 nationalities presented in 129 countries. Hapag Lloyd runs a fleet of about 240 vessels operated in 120 liner services. We operate out of six regional headquarters worldwide with Hamburg as the corporate headquarter. So what is moving us today? The industry has had a successful implementation of IMO 2020 with uh, the sulfur cut and the uh, significant improvement of air pollution. Now even more, the global earth warming, CO2 reduction and overall decarbonization is in focus. To put it a little bit in perspective, Compared to the global consumption of oil and the resulting emission, the maritime industry today is a small player. However, more than 90% of world trade is being carried by sea. With the continuous growth of trade in the past two decades, even with COVID-19, it is not expected that growth comes to a standstill in the coming decades. Hence, even with the moderate global trade growth until 2050, both consumption and emission will increase significant by lowest estimated plus 50%. Consequently, we have to seriously look at decarbonization. So what has been done already at Hapag Lloyd? Um, one big step, of course, is the economy of scale and the increased capacity. So uh, if we look at specific emissions, a 20,000 TEU vessel and uh, even the bigger ones really have helped here. But also weather routing and optimization of terminal operation play a big role. We have a fleet support center here in Hamburg uh, who is managing all of our 24, uh, 240 vessels um, on, on, on a 24-7 basis. 
And um, today, captains of the vessels get the directive uh, how to steer and uh, how to route uh, from land. Um, optimizing, of course, also terminal operations because uh, it doesn't make sense if you speed up um, going from the Suez Canal via the Mediterranean to end up um, on Anchorage uh, in front of the terminal in Rotterdam or Hamburg because another vessel is occupying your boats. So here, um, uh, optimization via digitization is one of the big um, steps uh, in work and um, already um, in motion. But vessels itself have received improved hull coating and hull forms have been optimized over the years. Just to give you a small indication, uh, modern hull coatings um, optimize uh, the, the consumption of these big container vessels by uh, three, four, five percent. That's not much, but adding it all together, it, it helps. And of course, uh, also our machine providers have done their job to further improve uh, machinery. All of the above can be seen in lower EEDI figures in the fleet and in reduced average emissions per transport load. This, however, will not be enough to reach the 2050 target um, and beyond. So for us, uh, the biggest uh, next step is fuel and uh, alternative fuels um, which need to be looked at. Most container carriers can already show a reduction of 40 to 50 percent per gram per TEU kilometer. That's the transport load container vessels are being uh, compared by over the last 10 years due to the measures just mentioned. Um, so, in a case um, that uh, I've, I've uh, shown here on the slide, a 4,600 TEU vessel in the 1990s, at that time one of the biggest container vessels we, op we operated worldwide, um, produces 100 gram per TEU kilometer, an absolute uh, total emission of uh, seven, uh, 78 tons of CO2 per annum. If we look at our huge 20,000 TEU vessels today, they run at 22 grams per TEU kilometer, and uh, they consume 84 tons uh, uh, or produce emission of 84 tons of CO2 on an annual basis. So um, we, we have achieved uh, a, our specific um, goal um, already. Um, the IMO target tw uh, for 2030 on a company level. Uh, but looking, for example, also at uh, the Green Deal, where we compare not to 2008 at the moment, but 1990, reduction in absolute CO2 emission per vessel um, has only shown efficiency gains. And uh, here, um, we still have uh, uh, to do our job. When looking at solutions, we need to consider the energy requirements of these ultra-large vessels. Over two megawatt is required to run reefer equipment at a port, uh, so a real challenge for land-based power. Consumption of around 100 tons of marine fuel oil per day, round trip duration for East to Europe is 80 days, and bunker supply needs to be available globally. This means that uh, Steps to decarbonize are small scale and often still in a project stage. Hubbard Lloyd, like some competitors, has started running vessels with a blend of marine fuel oil and used cooking oil. Fame, the CO2 reduction for biofuel per ton is said to be around 15%. And um, this is a first step to offer a green product. There is limited availability uh, for used cooking oil, and uh, it's not an ISO standard for marine fuel oil yet. So this is something that still needs to be done. We need flex date approval per vessel class, and uh, we also have in focus that um, we likely will not run vessels with 100% uh, biofuel because uh, there's ju just not, not, not enough of this fuel available. 
So uh, further generations of biofuel are being tested, cellulose waste, and uh, even um, um, uh, other um, methods to produce it. Also used um, as fuel for many years and already in new build container vessels, Hubbard is at the moment retrofitting an ultra-large vessel to use LNG. It's the first, it's a pilot, and it's the first uh, ultra-large vessel that's being retrofitted um, at uh, costs running above 30 million euros. So even the uh, LNG-ready vessels that we have in our fleet, um, to convert them, uh, time-wise, it takes um, uh, uh, three to four months and a significant amount of money. So um, the reduction to use LNG is 15 to 20 percent and the infrastructure has still been built up and increased globally. So um, is LNG the bridge for us, for future technology? Power to gas is the buzzword here. Based on green hydrogen, the first projects in Germany to produce methane to be used as synthetic natural gas, SNG, are running. The big advantage, SNG is a drop-in fuel for today's established LNG technology. Once commercially available, the global infrastructure can be assumed. LNG is a proven technology. Safety issues and technical issues are known and can be handled. So for SNG, it is now the challenge to get accepted as a major pathway and to gain a commercial level, which is competitive for the market. But SNG is not the only way forward. And we have seen it in uh, earlier presentations uh, already, what might work. On the left-hand side, uh, we see um, some, some examples that are already being used, flat um, rotor, windcraft, of course. A flattener rotor, the biggest one uh, that is available at the moment, uh, will produce not enough energy for our large container vessels to even run um, uh, the smallest auxiliary engine. Windcraft, if we go in winter over the North Atlantic, um, scale 10, scale 11, um, waves 15 meter high. So I wonder if uh, these huge container vessels will be able uh, to get support uh, by Windcraft. When I talk to our customers, big um, um, forwarders, for example, they clearly can see 3D printers and uh, drones um, carrying large loads from regional printer stations, or maybe even um, the uh, possibility uh, to work on hyperloops. This needs to be seen, and um, in particular, uh, with uh, the amount of uh, uh, world goods being moved around, um, how this can be developed. Um, on the right-hand side, um, we look at alternative fuels, and uh, here we are in power to x mode. Um, fuel cells um, is a possibility, of course, methanol and ammoniac, but also autonomous vessels. So um, all these are viable options and uh, they require specific preconditions. Just to give you a quick example, uh, when we started investigating running our Sagir, uh, the one we are retrofitting with LNG, um, we needed to start discussions with uh, port authorities and terminals along the route um, because we are running an LNG vessel and uh, dockers on the vessels might take uh, special precautions for safety reasons. Also, simultaneous operation uh, uh, by, by bunkering during load and discharge is one of the big issues. Our um, uh, new LNG vessel with a tank capacity of 6,500 cubic uh, meter need about six to seven hours bunkering. We have port stays uh, of around 10 to 12 hours. 
So if we add bunkering time because we have to unmoor and moor at a, a particular specific bunker station, this will not work. So simultaneous operation are key for our operation. Let, just imagine ammoniac as being toxic and um, corrosive um, at a simultaneous operation at a terminal where lots of people are running around the vessel. Um, that's difficult and that still needs a lot of work. Um, and the infrastructure, for the last 15 years, LNG has been um, um, established uh, as an infrastructure and still at the moment these big container vessels can only be bunkered in Rotterdam um, or in Singapore. So um, this is um, being built up but uh, still um, needs a lot more. So um, pathway to de decarbonization and already summarizing it. For deep sea power checks or synthetic fuels uh, derived from uh, renewable energy sources seem to be a, way, a good way to go. Based on hydrogen, not only SNG can be produced, but um, as, as a base, it is also being used for ammonia formation. Here still, academia, the technical experts, the machine factories, and also the oil majors need to work out best practice. But uh, we are not waiting for the um, uh, golden fuel or the silver bullet. We, as a container operator with uh, vessels who run for more than 25 years, have to act now. So collaboration with many different stakeholders is key. We believe that not one solution fits all, uh, and this goes for deep sea and short sea, for uh, tankers, for bulkers, for container liner vessels, for ferries, um, for, for, for passenger vessels. Uh, they all need to look for, for, for their own solutions. But two points matter for all. Infrastructure, this availability of molecules, and most of it, cost to market and the willingness to pay of our customers. Green products have a price. So with biofuel, uh, we're on our way to get market acceptance uh, for a first green product. LNG will further develop um, the necessary global infrastructure. Power to gas, and here SNG and first trials in Germany are ongoing, could be one successful way to move forward. So I hope I was able to give you a glimpse of um, how uh, Carrier try to work with uh, what we heard um, of directives and regulations of IMO. They're all very necessary because we need the level playing field but uh, we still need to go uh, a few steps and we need to go it together. Thanks a lot for your attention and back to Nele Matsluk or Alexander Holz. So. Thanks so much, it's me, uh, Mr. Erfman. This was another great um, presentation. Um, I'm, I'm particularly grateful that you shared the experiences and insights of a ship owning and ship operating company with all of us. You presented some very important and impressive figures, also what has already been achieved. But I'm also grateful that you made it very clear that there are big challenges ahead, both from a perspective of construction, support, availability of fuels, and so on and so forth. And it is, there cannot be any doubt that the, the pertinent measures have to be taken now. So there need to be some kind of, uh, of uh, working together collaboration between regulatory agencies, the industry, and other stakeholders. Thanks very, very much.